Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, and welcome to the Super Return Europe panel focused on technological innovation in the healthcare segment. My name is Michael Vicharik, and I'm a partner in Elm Capital, a global private placement agent and secondary advisor across private equity, private credit, and infrastructure. With the onset of the pandemic in 2020, global attention has understandably increased on healthcare. Our everyday lives are already impacted by innovation spurred by the restrictions imposed by the pandemic. As a prime example, the advent of Zoom, Teams, and other networking platforms that enable virtual meetings and events such as these. However, I am sure that the crisis has also helped to accelerate innovation in the healthcare segment to not only fight the disease battle today, but also focus on long-term improvements in treatments and delivery of healthcare to all individuals. With me today, we have three impressive panelists who are experts in their own regard across different segments of healthcare tech. Perhaps before we commence our discussion, I'd like to ask each to start uh, and give a brief introduction to themselves. Alex? Sure, thank you, Michael. Uh, very nice to be on this panel and thank you to my esteemed panelists as well. Um, I uh, am a co one of three co-founders of Luxera Capital Partners, a, uh, a, a healthcare-focused international asset management firm uh, begun in 2020 and which uh, has launched our debut Luxera Growth One Fund uh, in early 2021, targeting a fund size of 150 million euros, uh, which we recently announced that we had raised just under 100 million in our first close. Our strategy is focused on commercial stage health tech companies in Europe, where we see tremendous innovation uh, with, with, a, with a rate of innovation and in company formation in Europe in the health tech sector, two or three times that of uh, the US, but yet a gap in, in funding at, for companies at the growth stage of, uh, of, of nearly 90% less than, uh, than, than the US. And so our team is the mixture of operators and investors. I'm a pure investor by background uh, in the health tech space. My two co-founders, Pierre Moustial and Sam Levy are both operators. Sam building a business from zero to 30 million of revenue and Pierre uh, running Ergo Group and growing it uh, over 23 times uh, to uh, over 700 million euros of turnover. So we bring a, 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 a set of operational uh, as well as investment expertise that uh, focuses on growth stage in the EU and has strong links to the US uh, as I'm based in, uh, in San Francisco. It's great to be on the panel, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Michael? Hi, thank you, Michael. So yeah, appreciate being on the uh, panel. Uh, so uh, just in brief, I wear uh, several hats, one at uh, NeuroHealth, uh, Global NeuroHealth Ventures. Uh, we're a philanthropic venture firm, uh, and we're formed out of uh, anecdotal observation that a lot of the early stage clinical neuroscience companies that are doing incredible work, we're having a very tough time getting funding. Um, and, and so we, we looked at this empirically. Uh, we were very fortunate to get data from Silicon Valley Bank, Pitchbook for the last 30 years. And, and that confirmed our anecdotal observations that there really is a paucity of funding for these companies, um, even though a lot of them ultimately end up doing very well. Uh, so, so based on this, we formed a uh, accelerator and uh, the impact uh, venture fund uh, to help support these companies. Um, another hat that I wear, one of the companies that we've incubated, I'm actually an operator for uh, NeuroHealth Technologies. Uh, and so this, this again was incubated and launched out of Global NeuroHealth Ventures. Uh, and what we do is we support the provision of remote mental health care. Um, and the issue that we're really targeting, this was already uh, a need before the pandemic, but uh, since the pandemic, uh, only 8% of mental health care uh, providers actually used any kind of remote care, and now it's close to 100%. And, and, and with this, it really highlighted a major pain point in terms of provision of that care, um, that they can't uh, read the patients as well as they can in office. So 50% of human communication is nonverbal, and, and a lot of this is lost uh, doing the remote uh, clinical care. So a uh, patient could be tapping their foot, indicating that they're becoming more anxious or postural changes, things along those lines. So what we developed were um, uh, uh, tools through affective neuroscience uh, that uh, develop passive digital biomarkers uh, that, that help the, the, the clinician actually read the patient 
in real time uh, with clinical indices, emotions, uh, mental status information. Um, and so then uh, just briefly the last hat that I wear, uh, part-time uh, clinical faculty at uh, UC Berkeley. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Michael. Uh, Francois? Yeah, thanks, Michael. Very nice to be on the panel as well. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm Francois Robinet. I'm the uh, managing partner for Axa Venture Partner, AVP. We started in 2015. Uh, we invest not only in health tech, uh, we, invest, we invest in tech in general, um, in particular in uh, enterprise software, uh, fintech, insurtech, marketplace, consumer platform, but also digital health. What we don't do, we don't do a biotech and medtech, we don't take molecular risk or a regulatory risk, um, but we invest in every uh, technology-based company that solves a problem for the health tech ecosystem, patient, uh, provider, uh, employer, or payer. Uh, that's what we do. We do that uh, early stage and, and growth. We have uh, two funds, an early stage fund of uh, $155 million uh, uh, and a growth fund of a bit more than $500 million. Um, so going from really C to C, really C, D, and, uh, and, and onward, and we do that in the US and in Europe. Half of the team is in the US, half of the team is in Europe. Uh, and in terms of capital, and in Europe we include Israel as well. Um, uh, and in terms of uh, capital deployed, uh, it's also about half half between the two continents. So that's what we do. I'm very happy to be on the panel. Fantastic. Thank you, Francois. So why don't we move directly, I guess, first uh, to the big question, of course, uh, relating to last year, and that is the impacts of the pandemic. Uh, maybe if we can explore the discussion in some of the challenges and opportunities that have emerged in 2020, uh, has the pandemic you know, spurred focus and investment in healthcare for both private and public sectors? And also, I guess, in particular, uh, in your experience, how do you see technology addressing the much needed improvements in the legacy physical infrastructure? Maybe if we start with Michael first. You on mute, Michael? One of the, uh, yep. So, so I think one of the, the biggest challenges has been uh, tracking chronic patients. Um, a lot of times the, the clinicians are, are used to them coming in uh, at a decent cadence where they could really track the symptomatology that they have and, and adjust the treatments. Uh, likewise, in, in some of the, you know, more uh, acute areas for this includes neurology, mental health. And, and so it, that, that, that was really a huge challenge uh, at the front end and, and uh, clinicians and healthcare systems have uh, really adapted beautifully with that, uh, adopting very quickly a lot of, by, obviously by necessity, a lot of new technologies um, uh, the biggest being the, the telehealth platform to, to be able to continue to monitor the patients. But then other technology in terms of digital phenotyping and the like to, to really be able to gain insights. And, and through that, it's been interesting how quickly it's progressed and then the reception of it, both by the patients and the clinicians, how well received it's been for the most part. There's pain points, obviously, with it. Um, but that uh, they're really interested in sticking with it, both the patients and, and the clinicians and the healthcare systems. Um, and so that provides a tremendous opportunity where a lot of these technologies are, are at, at their infancy and there's a lot of room for improvement. And it appears that a lot of the folks are gonna be sticking with it. And so uh, taking these, these opportunities and figuring out ways that these uh, remote uh, avenues of care can be uh, improved upon. Perfect. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Alex? Sure. You know, I think it is a tale of uh, legacy data silos remaining in healthcare uh, centered on uh, uh, typically a hospital or health system based EMR. And then the incredible explosion of data outside uh, of those data silos, whether it is from uh, employer-based benefits like Livongo to help patients manic, manage chronic diseases, uh, whether it is remote monitoring, whether it is patient reported outcomes, you know, a number of new models have, uh, have, have come into the fore driven by the pandemic simply because 
providers and uh, and employers and and uh, Medicare Advantage plans, et cetera, want to know where their patients are and what they're doing. And so I think, you know, from my perspective, not only have you had this explosion of data outside the realm of the EHR, what is going to be very interesting as the pandemic recedes is how those silos get merged, uh, what parts get merged, what parts don't, and what parts could potentially ultimately disrupt the, uh, you know, the legacy healthcare infrastructure, uh, not, not only in the U.S., but in, 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 you know, globally as well, in a way that I think would be beneficial for innovation overall by creating a more open architecture for data sharing. So I'm excited uh, to see where things, uh, w where things happen, and we certainly have our own ideas about uh, uh, what, which silos are, are more vulnerable than others. Thank you. Francois? Yeah, well, I was going to say that um, yeah, the, the, the crisis has been clearly, I mean, everybody says that in this coup has been a catalyst for technology, but still, I mean, you know, in the middle of a global recession, right, in the middle of a very uh, uh, difficult economic crisis, and therefore capital was allocated where it was necessary to allocate it, right? So you mentioned Zoom and Teams and all this, like, there was no other solution, right? It was either we do that or we are out, out of business. And what's remarkable is that in the healthcare ecosystem, that has been the, the same thing. I mean, we have seen in our, for instance, in our B2B uh, business that sometimes, yeah, there was technology adoption, but there was no budget, right? So it was a bit difficult. For for many of the um, of, um, healthcare companies, technology-based, I mean, there was demand even in a, in a, in 2020, either out of necessity, as uh, Michael said, I mean, telemedicine is an obvious uh, is an obvious uh, example, but also because there was new uh, needs that emerged. Uh, monitoring of chronic disease is one. How to do that remotely, right, in a, at scale, um, but also other needs coming from patients themselves, like mental health. I mean, we have seen an explosion of not only companies. Uh, providing all kinds of mental health um, um, solutions, uh, but also a much greater adoption by people. And I guess the stress caused by the COVID environment is partly responsible for that. It's one reason for that. Perfect. Thank you, Francois. And, you know, in terms of, I guess, habits and also changes that we've experienced uh, during the pandemic, uh, and one of them, of course, being the massive migration to remote care and digital health. Uh, do we think that these changes will be further adopted and essentially stick after the pandemic? Uh, maybe we start with Alex on views on that topic. Sure. You know, I think the traditional uh, frustration of uh, whether you're in the venture space or the growth space around health tech has been the way the system can be stacked against innovation. Uh, but when innovation does break through after careful investment with great teams, whether it is continuous glucose monitoring instead of sticking yourself, uh, you know, twice a day, whether it is non-invasive prenatal testing uh, rather than an amniocentesis uh, that is, you know, much better and without danger. When those innovations finally do break through and achieve broad product market fit and coverage, we, we have seen rapid adoption in the past. And so I think what the pandemic has done is it has exposed uh, many digital health and telemedicine driven models uh, to the broader populace uh, five years ahead of where it would have been exposed to, that po to, to people, be, excuse me, to people before. And I think for a lot of use cases and a lot of health needs for patients, it's going to be the preferred, uh, the preferred choice and the preferred way to interact with providers. That being said, there is definitely a great deal of uh, care that has been uh, deferred that is in, in more specialty areas, in areas where you do need to see a patient, uh, excuse me, a provider in person. Um, and, you know, th I, I think increasingly uh, in-person models will have to have a hybrid solution um, to, to addressing uh, exactly what a patient wants, because once you take innovation out of uh, the box that the system wants to keep it in, you can't put it back. So it, it's an exciting time overall. Thank you. Uh, Francois, I saw you shaking the hand, your head there. Do you largely agree? Any, any views? No, no, I completely agree with, uh, with, with Alex, absolutely. No, I mean, you know, uh, 
yeah, could be good to know uh, at which level uh, things will settle going forward, of course. But I mean, it's obvious that the world will not be uh, the same before the compared to, to I, I mean, after compared to before. Um, I, 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 I read an article when, when they were saying that 18% of the people, I think it was in the US or in Europe, where, whatever, um, before the crisis used telemedicine at least once. And after, like now, not after, but during the crisis, let's say, uh, 76 people says that, 76% uh, of people say that they will, they have used or they will use in the future telemedicine. So is it going to be 76%? Is it going to be 60, 50? I don't know. It's definitely going to be more than the 18 that we had, well, that we had before. So there is defin definitely um, an acceleration in adoption, uh, an acceleration in the solutions that are available in many dimensions. I mean, telemedicine is the obvious one because we can easily relate to it, but it's, uh, it's true in uh, data management, it's true in uh, optimization of um, hospital management, it's true in AI-based application, it's true in you know, many dimensions. I think one uh, uh, important dimension uh, is what the payers will do and how they will support this, this trend. Because uh, greater adoption from, let's say, the healthcare community, this, this is clear, but in the end, where the money will go. Um, uh, and I think the key, uh, a key criteria for that will be uh, Return on investment, basically. Um, you know, if if in addition of a better uh, patient experience, um, you can also achieve cost reduction. We all know the you know, the issue of uh, rising as their cost. Definitely, the payer will support that. Payer being social uh, security system or uh, private insurers, and there will be an even greater adoption uh, and and a more permanent adoption. Great, thank you, Francois. Michael? Yeah, I completely uh, agree with both Alex and Francois with uh, with that. And just a couple things to add to it too. You know, I, I have to say, I was just amazed how early in the pandemic, uh, clinicians, heads of healthcare systems, heads of hospitals said, you know, we're, we're gonna stick with this. So they newly adopted it. And even in the spring of last year, the summer of last year, they said, you know, we're sticking with this. And for all, you know, all the reasons that, that you know, we've talked about um, so far. And, and so it's interesting in terms of the C-suite leadership and whatnot, the, it, it seems like the conversation's almost taking it a step further now and, and thinking about, okay, how can we generate new forms of revenue through remote, remote care? Um, and that goes in, dials into, you know, Francois, what Francois was just mentioning in terms of the payers and each country, it's it's unique in terms of the reimbursement and, and navigating that and trying to trying to solve that puzzle. And then the other aspect is, you know, because you know these healthcare systems, you know, are, are talking about because we're committed to remote care, how can we help our clinicians do it better? Uh, what tools are available for our clinicians to be able to um, both do a better job at it, um, feel more confident in it. Um, and then they're attentive to, and it's great that they're talking about uh, clinician quality of work life too, uh, to help enhance that as they're providing the remote care and the transition to that. Great, thank you, Michael. Uh, why don't we move to the topic of digitalization and, and specifically here, what areas of healthcare could see the biggest benefits in moving to a more digital format? And in your views, maybe what are the challenges in making this a successful transition? Why don't we kick off with uh, Francois first? Yeah, uh, I would say, I mean, the, the, the main criteria for success or the main success factors, again, is uh, what will be the driver? Is it going to be the player that will support the move to dig digitalization by I would say almost throwing money to it and supporting it big way. I mean, one interesting example uh, that is very local to me and close to me, uh, Dr. Lib, which is a, a company in France doing, um, um, it's an online platform doing a doctor appointment, right? They have been used, so it's a relatively simple application. Now they have expanded to other things and it's a fairly sizable business worth probably 2 billion uh, euro. Um, uh, the government has used them now to, to organize 
vaccine distribution uh, for COVID-19. I mean, this is a big boost, of course. I mean, this type of initiative will be a key, a key driver of success. Another driver of success will be, I mean, they, they are part of the ecosystem that are really broken. Uh, I mean, we know the cost aspect. Uh, there is also a shortage, or shortage of talent aspect. Uh, in, the, in the imaging uh, space, for instance, um, you, 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 you all know that uh, in Europe, but I guess it's the same in the, in the US, um, there is a real shortage of talent. In France, again, the average age of a radiologist in 2010 was 51 years. It's now 56 years. And in five years, there will be 25% of them going into retirement without being replaced. That's a massive problem. It's the same in the UK. I think it's even worse in the UK. Um, so the good news is that AI-based application will be able to solve that in a very effective way. The, the level of performance of AI uh, which is now level in terms of false positive or false negative, better than, than the best expert actually. So that's going to be, that's an example that, that that's going to be a huge driver of adoption. Why? Because there's no other solution and because it's the only way to solve this problem. Perfect. Thank you for your input, Francois. Maybe Michael? Yeah, so I, I think one of the biggest areas for this to be deployed would be, you know, again, the chronic condition. So that's, that's where the biggest uh, expenses are within the healthcare system and, and the biggest need. And, and you know, it, it's amazing the sensitivity specificity that a lot of these uh, digital mental health and uh, just general digital health uh, devices provide. Um, just to give a specific example, so my, I, I'm still part-time practicing clinical neuropsychologist, and mm -hmm. we have these battery of tests that we give to to test cognitive functioning, and and I've just been amazed and, and quite frankly humbled by these other routes to get information about cognitive uh, psychiatric functioning. So there's companies doing the digital phenotyping. There's remote testing that even the the way by which someone moves a mouse across a computer, very sensitive things that can get insight into tension functioning, you know, memory functioning. And, and this is incredibly valuable for, you know, chronic CNS conditions for uh, detecting crises. So, so being able to flag crises uh, to, to prevent uh, various um, uh, ailments from, from getting acute. Um, so I think there's a lot of promise with that, uh, with the technology. I think in terms of the, the, the challenges is really just getting the empirical proof. So, um, you know, not, not just finding in circumscribed space uh, efficacy, you know, studies, but, but more effectiveness studies, seeing, you know, broader uh, deployed within clinical settings, is it, is it still effective in those contexts? And then the data, I mean, that's that's really, you know, with a lot of these machine learning AI approaches is getting good good quality data. Um, it used to be that data was, you know, the gold and now labeled data is the new gold. Um, and having data that's, that's effectively labeled so that you can actually determine uh, the, the variables and the healthcare um, symptoms of interest based on the data. Great, thank you, Michael. Alex? Gonna say, I think it speaks to the opportunity that we can all cite different examples and I'll cite a, a different one, which is the operating room. Chronic care, absolutely the biggest bucket. One, another big bucket is procedural medicine in the hospital and in the outpatient surgery center. You know, I go and get my car repaired. I, 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 I'm typically not there while they're repairing it. At least they give me a checklist back telling me what they've done. Today, uh, all that comes out of most operating procedures is a two or three paragraph surgeon's note, which is more or less them repeating the same things over and over again. You know, we see a tremendous opportunity to digitize a lot of the uh, sensor-based, uh, you know, video-based and workflow-based checklists that uh, can be implemented in the OR, uh, perform the right analytics on those, and, uh, you know, sort of achieve a triple aim of better patient care, better patient safety, uh, better surgeon efficiency, better room turnover, uh, and overall cost savings to both the provider and the health system at the end of the day, uh, bringing the surgery, which today is such a black box, into, uh, into the 21st century, so to speak. The traditional issue there has just been scaling and go going provider by provider and creating a business model 
And I would say what's new is that uh, med tech companies, the companies that sell the implants, are increasingly hungry to uh, get access to at least some of that data and partner with uh, digital solutions. And so we see a tremendous uh, opportunity in the operating room as well, as I would, of course, agree with my fellow panelists um, in, uh, you know, in, in their points as well. Um, and in fact, we're about to announce an investment uh, in a hospital OR uh, software platform uh, in the coming weeks so that we're very excited about. Fabulous. Thank you, Alex. Uh, let's maybe talk a little bit about uh, helping some of these opportunities grow and scale and, you know, particularly maybe tackling the challenges involved in commercializing and scaling digital health businesses, both domestically in the home markets, but also if you have any views on uh, bringing this, those businesses abroad as well internationally. Uh, maybe if we kick off with Michael first. Yeah, I think there's there's obviously a lot of issues with it and, and potential pain points with the uh, with the scaling and growth. I'll I'll hit on a couple quickly. So you know what's interesting right now is obviously there's tremendous tailwinds for this uh, policy changes, reimbursement, uh, uh, provider adoption, et cetera, et cetera. So so that that's a boon for for you know quick scaling commercialization. Um, that said, it's it's a pretty fluid environment. I mean, the the policies uh, seem to be changing, you know, almost on uh, a weekly basis here in the U.S. I know there's been very rapid changes uh, elsewhere too. So so being able to have your technology in position in a way that it has an affinity, you know, for commercial launch and scaling that it dials in nicely to the current policies is kind of a moving target, which. Uh, is 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 difficult and and you know specifically with reimbursement too, um, so it takes some you know footwork with that to 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 navigate those aspects. But again, I, you know the bottom line is there's there's great tailwinds for it that I think will help a lot, a lot of these um, uh, endeavors. So so the other one is in, in and I think this is something that uh, is is overlooked at least in some of its subtleties is. Um, how to work your innovation into the clinical workflow. So, uh, you know, healthcare systems are notorious for, for being uh, resistant to change. We've, we're all kind of, I think, uh, at least in part kind of aghast, uh, really surprised by how quickly we've adjusted and it's been great with the pandemic. But, but the fact remains it's still, you still really have to work into the clinician's workflow and have it uh, be kind of seamless because if your innovation adds more work, even there's been studies that have shown even if there's better patient outcome, it just it, it, it's very difficult in terms of the adoption. So so that's another kind of challenge to the scaling is to make sure that really um, is is implemented in a way that the clinicians feel comfortable with it. It doesn't add you know extra time or much extra time to their clinical workflow. Thank you, uh, Alex. Sure, you know, to, to, to build on Michael's points, I think that, and just taking digital health as an example, um, you know, in, the, in Europe, uh, these digital health companies generally benefit from a really, uh, a great ability to access larger populations and data in their home markets. And uh, whether that is uh, a company like uh, Sword in Port Portugal or, or Kaya in musculoskeletal conditions, um, uh, you know, in, in Germany or uh, Oviva, a, a chronic condition management and diabetes platform in Switzerland, these, these platforms can typically build a very strong presence, you know, by being first and having the right sort of locally driven partnerships. And what that can allow is the generation of really stellar clinical data uh, and really stellar outcomes data for you know what are typically uh, more monolithic payers uh, in Europe, and it, it it's a high bar to immediately prove your return on investment to those payers, which I think is then leverageable. I think what you you know as, as you look at the landscape as these EU companies try to scale outside of first their home markets, but then particularly to the U.S. I think that these companies could make and leverage more, uh, uh, you know, the really high quality clinical data that they've been able to generate relative to U.S. counterparts, where typically 
you are uh, doing small pilots on individual employers' populations versus, you know, again, uh, some of these players who have contracts with, say, the national health system in the UK or large, uh, you know, large uh, 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 regional insurers in other European markets. I think the data is of significant quality and, uh, you know, will be uh, very helpful in scaling uh, EU digital health models born in the EU uh, worldwide. Thank you, Alex. Francois? Yeah, that, that, that's interesting. Um, uh, clearly, there's a lot of tailwinds for quicker adoption uh, in, in all markets. Uh, having said that, there's still a uh, real barrier to uh, globalization for some of the, uh, for some application in the uh, in digital health. So clearly not for biotech, medtech, or, or digital health that are more a therapeutic component, maybe. But for many of them, I mean, the thing is that it has to work in a given framework. It has to work in the um, um, health ecosystem, in the local health ecosystem between the payer, the provider, the patient, and the and the employer. And you don't deal with the NHS, or you deal with the French social security, or with the uh, uh, you know Medicare, Medicaid in the in the US, or the private insurance in the US. And therefore, many of these business have shaped their, 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 their business model around their local ecosystem, which makes real globalization really challenging and really difficult. And actually, it, it, it doesn't really happen, right? Um, you have, you, you, I don't know, I mean, it's worth, I don't know what's, what it's worth, but you had 500 unicorns in the end of last year. You have 31 in the uh, healthcare, um, healthcare space, six percent to be compared to the what, 12 to 18 percent of uh, healthcare cost um, in the share of, 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 of the GDP. So it tells something, right? There, there is barrier to globalization, uh, clearly. Um, the good news is that the problem is so vast and so big that even by remaining in your local market or in Europe, in the EU, you can build a big business, right? Uh, no, I mean, clearly in the US, you know, uh, live and go uh, 18 billion. So, you know, just being in the US, just on one vertical, uh, 18 billion uh, business. So there, there is room uh, for to build big business in the local market. There is clearly barrier for uh, globalization. Thank you, Francois. Well, we have about two and a half, three minutes left to the conclusion of this panel, and maybe just a brief 30 to 45 seconds from each panelist on one final topic, and that's the area of uh, B2C platforms that, are, of course, are targeting millennial health needs. Uh, maybe if you could share some examples and some trends that you believe will be successful in the near future. Alex? Sure. Real briefly, I think that these platforms, uh, for instance, HIMSS in the men's health space or Row, uh, 30 Madison, which is, is an under the radar, but, you know, very key platform um, in, uh, in the U.S., effectively address millennial health needs directly through an app and their business models are typically monetized through, uh, you know, pres prescribed medications um, where you have a simple telehealth visit. I think it's lowered the barriers to care in certain verticals that are primarily pharmacy driven uh, and that typically have some social stigma attached to them. Open question whether they can generalize to primary care and other more difficult specialty conditions, but it's certainly a trend to watch. Thank you. Francois? Yes, uh, I would say, I mean, uh, Alex mentioned earlier that um, the, 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 the way that are managed is going to be interesting to, 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 to see and, uh, the, in the future. Um, I mentioned Livango. Livango is a big success doing just diabetes. When you think about it, uh, why just when, uh, because, you know, when you have a condition like diabetes, it's very likely that you have something else, depression, uh, cardiovascular uh, disease or so on. And therefore, one of the trends I, I, I think will be uh, um, a digital platform having a more holistic approach of the patient, addressing more of their needs, um, more, more, more of their uh, pathology. The interesting company in the, in the US called Vida, Vida Health that is doing that. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's the same model but applied to uh, a multi uh, pathology model. And as you said, I mean, um, uh, the, what digital uh, application uh, have brought also is uh, is democratization of care in some uh, in some specific areas like mental health. There, there, there was a lot of stigma associated in, in the 
with mental health in the US, even more in Europe. Uh, shortage of uh, of um, of you know of, of doctors of uh, psychiatrists, uh, very expensive. I mean, this has, this allows big democratization of um, mental health care. I think this is a big trend. Uh, you mentioned fertility. That's the same thing. Fertility also there was a lot of stigma. Uh, we've seen many platforms uh, providing different types of solutions from fertility tracking to even a marketplace putting together um, uh, clinics, fertility clinics and women that want to have a city fertility. I, be, I mean, this is, this is not a trend that, that it's a new trend basically. And it's a new trend that, that, that meets a, a real need and a real expectation from millions. Great, thank you. And Michael? Yeah, just quickly for for sake of time, I know we're just about out of time. Um, I just uh, also add and highlight uh, brain health uh, in in the B two C area. There, uh, tremendous technologies that are being developed that can very accurately, um, very precisely measure uh, brain health changes in brain health, and then and then what's almost more important is actionable items that the individual can take to then boost it and they can track and they can see, you know, what's making my brain health increase, what's what's making it decrease. Mm. Um, so I, I see that as being very compelling going forward as well. Fabulous. Well, thank you very much uh, to my distinguished panelists uh, this afternoon. I very much appreciate your insights and your time. Uh, to everyone tuning into the panel, uh, please don't hesitate uh, to reach out to any of our panelists directly and continue the discussion offline. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much, Thank Michael. Thank you all. Thanks, Michael. Thanks very much.